Pat My Mother's Voice by Julian J. Alexander. The head of yet another six-inch nail is forced crudely into the hard flesh of what feels like the millionth wooden plank. Its end contorted by the panicked blow it had been dealt by my shaking hands. There must have been about 40 or 50 wooden boards covering every possible opening now. In truth, I had lost count hours ago, because the only thing I was focused on was making it go away. What it actually is remains a mystery to me, even now as I board up the tiny back window in the basement, banishing the last few rays of sunlight that had crept their way into my house, and the strange kaleidoscope colors that threw themselves violently against the shutters. Each room is now in a state of half-dark, simulating the night that was already fast approaching. Walking around the house with flashlight in hand, it looks like some kind of silver screen apocalypse scenario. Boxes of nails spilling out onto the floor, and misshapen boards hammered clumsily into plaster. To anyone passing by my house over the last few hours, I most likely came across as a lunatic, as the sound of my hysterical pummeling permeated the thin walls. But I don't care. There is something out there that wishes to do me harm. And it isn't going away. The catalyst for the anxiety that had led to this began two days ago, presenting itself in the form of a series of events that were stranger than fiction, and far too close together to be coincidental. Each time something happened, I knew that it was a ploy that this thing had set up to try and get me to let it in. It started with that fire pit in the field. At least, I think that's what it was. Allow me to explain, if I can. My family used to live in a fairly rural backcountry area that consisted of flat, earthy fields, punctuated by the occasional copse or astoundingly small housing community. After my dad passed away, my mother wasn't ready to sell the house, not even when she eventually moved into a flat in the nearest town. She treated the old house like a country retreat, and told me that any time I took a break from work I was welcome to stay there. I had recently taken up a new job that permitted me to work from home, and so I took up residence in the house to swap the bustle of city living that I was so used to for a more tranquil setting. The fields around these parts are mostly used for growing potatoes, and extended on for miles and miles until the only thing that accompanies them on the horizon is the setting sun. The house is situated at the end of one of these small pockets of housing, next to yet another expanse of dirt that is overlooked by a looming forest, one of the larger ones in the general area. The terrain out back is owned by a local farmer, a somewhat grizzled older gentleman whose name I could never recall. All I could assume about him from the perpetual scowl on his face was that he would never take kindly to anyone messing around on his land, which is ultimately why I was so confused when those kids set up a fire pit in the middle of his potato field late one night. It was a comfortably warm night in July, one of those rare times when the air neither warranted taking a coat on a walk nor did it cling to your skin or hang heavy with gnats. I think it was a Saturday meaning that I had spent most of the day working in my study, sifting through crumpled paperwork and taking intermittent coffee breaks that always ran on a little longer than I told myself they would. An hour and a half after the sun had concluded its sluggish retreat behind the trees, I had begun standing by the printer, my eyes growing weary as I watched the outdated machine groan loudly as it struggled to spit out yet another document. As it wrestled with its own mechanical innards, my gaze wandered to the window beside me. It was considerably dark outside, and all I could see was a faint reflection of myself and the surrounding room. The vague shape of the distant tree line, a dark blob against the navy sky that grew inkier by the second. The printer forced out a piece of paper with an obnoxious whine, briefly pulling my attention from the window and onto the document that had been considerably creased by the ink roller. I sighed, deeply, but as my eyes shifted back to the window, the irritation dissolved and was replaced by a sudden curiosity. In the middle of the dark frame, 
a faint glow had appeared. Seeming as though it was floating there, I walked to the other end of the study and killed the light, knowing that I would perhaps be able to see the outside a little better. Upon flicking the switch, I returned to the window and found that the dull glow was not dull at all. It was in fact stunningly bright. As my eyes adjusted, it occurred to me that I was looking at a fire. Seemingly man-made, but due to the distance, I couldn't really be sure. For all I knew, I could have been witnessing the beginning of a forest fire. Knowing that I couldn't just ignore it, I rushed down the stairs, hurriedly sliding my feet into a pair of hiking boots and fumbled clumsily with the door handle, as though I had been blind drunk for the last hour. I dashed out into the night and around the side of the house, nearly tripping over a hose pipe that lay snugly in the gravel. I vaulted the fence that divided the potato field from the house and started towards the brilliant blaze at the edge of the woods, trying my best to ignore the awkward ridges of dry dirt that crumbled under my feet as I moved. I must have been about halfway across the field when a sound cut through the silence of the otherwise still summer night, stopping me dead in my tracks. It was a cry, clearly that of a human, but not one of distress or pain. I listened closely, making sure not to do so much as shift a grain of dirt underfoot. Sure enough, more voices followed, the yelp from up ahead seemingly close to where the fire was. The voices that carried on the air were those of young people, teenagers or perhaps university students who were messing around in their summer holiday. They were laughing and yelling in what sounded like a half-drunken state, the alcohol impairing any consideration they may have previously had for keeping their gathering a secret to the local farmer. Looking on, it occurred to me then that the blaze that had been set at the foot of the woods was not what I initially feared it to be. It was instead a fire pit that had been set up by the group. Despite the ferocious brightness of the flames, I could not make out any figures, or even silhouettes, of people sat around the fire pit. I assumed they had perhaps started making their way into the woods, and so I began pacing towards the fire once again, with a mind to let them know that they needed to put that damn thing out before they knocked it over and turned the forest into a hellish inferno. I had not walked more than six feet before my left boot came into contact with a particularly hard, stubborn clod of dried mud, tripping me over and sending me sprawling onto the rock-like ground before me. With a groan, I pushed myself up, spitting the bitter taste of soil from my mouth. I shifted my eyes from the ground to the fire that was now... gone. The fire was gone. I had gotten up almost as soon as I had fallen over, so there was no way that those kids could have put it out in such a small amount of time. Moreover, the night was now as still as it had been before. There were no laughs or shouts of joy. Hell, now there wasn't even so much as the occasional rustle of leaves by the woodland's edge or the distant hum of a car engine. I ran toward where I believed the fire to have been, pulling out the torch that I had crudely stuffed into my pocket on the way out of the house. Again nearly tripping on more rigid clubs of dirt, I reached the edge of the forest and shone the wide beam around the area. No acrid scent of smoke lingered in the air to indicate that there had been a smouldering bonfire there moments before, nor were there any discarded bottles that would have suggested the presence of those kids. There had been no one here. But I had heard them. Clear as a goddamn bell. I had seen the fire too, yet there were no charred logs littered around, and there was no sign of the fire pit that I had assumed it was contained in. How the hell could I have imagined it? I stumbled back through the field, considerably shaken up from what I had either witnessed or imagined, my shirt and jeans stained with the mud from the fall I had taken. Just as I reached the gate, a great whoosh sound invaded my ears followed closely by a chorus of raucous laughter. Just the same as the shouts of those kids that I had been so sure I heard earlier. I wheeled around, the flashlight nearly falling from my hand as it cut a swathe through the now pitch darkness of the field. I fully expected to see the fire pit before me, the flames battling the night as those youngsters sat around it with half-empty beer bottles, laughing and joking and swapping stories. Once again, there was nothing there. 
The night lay in the same state of eerie quiet as before the cacophony of sounds had assaulted my ears. Bewildered, I threw myself over the gate and stumbled as I hit the ground on the other side, quickly regaining my balance and sprinting to the front door, kicking up the gravel as I ran. I practically jumped through the doorway, slamming the door hard behind me and turning the key in the lock with panicked ferocity. A thousand questions rushed through my brain, some hurrying by before any answer, no matter how nonsensical, could be conjured up. Had there actually been anyone out there? Had the stress of a long week of staring at faded ink on inordinate amounts of crumpled paper bent my mind to such a point where I hallucinated the fire and the voices of those kids? No. The fire had been burning for too long. Were it an hallucination, the flames would have all but disappeared in the blink of an eye, and the voices would have been nothing but the misconstrued cry of an owl. There must have been something out there. I tried not to think of it as I lay my head down to rest that night. The unanswered questions rushed back to me as soon as my eyes shot open in the morning. I won't bore you with the mundanity of the uneventful daylight hours that followed since all they entailed were a few half-hearted attempts at sifting through yet more paperwork, only to be constantly interrupted by thoughts of the previous night. As I sat at my desk, my eyes continuously wandered from the mass of documents to the window, as the sun once again slowly descended into the horizon, like a coin in a battered arcade machine, waiting with an ever-tightening knot in my stomach for that familiar glow to explode through the darkness. It came eventually. Not in an interval, when my gaze had returned to my desk, but in the fleeting third of a second that it took to blink. I had been fixed upon the window. Now, having turned the light out in order to better see the field and the edge of the woods, the fire had reappeared, as bright as it had burned the night before. There had been no dim glow that would have been indicative of somebody setting the fire, nor were the flames slowly climbing higher. In an instant, the blaze was as tall and strong as it would have been were it burning for twenty minutes before. I had to know what the hell was going on. This time, I had to see it up close. I grabbed the torch and descended the stairs, trying amidst the shaking breaths to maintain a calmer demeanor than I had done the previous night. I donned the same hiking boots, Exiting the house and locking the door behind me. The keys in my quaking hand produced a metallic clatter as they came into contact with the door. Another reminder of my persistent anxiety. I began to make my way to the gate, readying the torch for the moment when I would step out of the floodlight bathed driveway. The hose pipe from the night before, still sat half buried in the gravel, contorted in such a way that it resembled some kind of snake awaiting its quarry. As I rounded the house, and my eyes were freed from obstruction, I could see that the fire was indeed still burning, the darkness so prevalent that even outside, the blaze looked as though it were hovering in mid-air. The sky was a ragged black cloak, the few holes in its delicate fibers revealing shiny specks of stars, all too meager to decorate such a hostile picture. After walking through and shutting the gate, I switched off the torch and pocketed it, trying to stay as quiet as possible. As I approached the fire pit, I made sure to keep my steps sure-footed and light to avoid alerting whoever was around the fire, if there was anyone at all, that I was there. As the fire grew bigger and bigger in my field of vision, I started hearing the familiar youthful laughter, the shouts of joy, and the occasional clink of a glass bottle. There was something else, though. Something... different. Three silhouettes were sitting in front of the fire pit. The flames so tall now, that from a distance, those vaguely human shapes were unnoticeable. My breath quickened, and the knot in my stomach shot up into my throat, yet I still continued my steady approach towards the fire. The laughter continued, and as I grew closer, I could see a hand raising a beer bottle into the air, confirming that these silhouettes were indeed those of people. 
It felt far more real than it did the previous night. This time, the scent of smoke was now hanging in the air, growing stronger with each step. The thing was, it wasn't just smoke. Smoke tends to maintain a smell that somehow sits comfortably between pungent and pleasant, but now a far more offensive scent had climbed atop the aroma of the burning wood. It was the unmistakable stench of decay, so sudden and so strong that it was impossible to ignore. The flames were now no more than ten feet away from me, and I could make out more details of the previously vague silhouettes of the three people hunched over next to the fire pit. I could still hear them laughing, yet none of them seemed to be moving now. No turning to look at one another, no swaying in their seats, and no raised arms as they told drunken stories. I walked another five feet and cleared my throat, preparing to address the three youngsters. Jesus, that smell was so strong. Hey, I barked in the most authoritative, gruff voice I could muster. What the hell are you lot doing here? This is private land. The three kids didn't respond but the laughter ceased as soon as I spoke, as though the jovial sounds of their gathering were being played on a tape that had just reached its end. My eyes darted to the fire, expecting it to disappear in a flash just as it had last night. Yet it still burned, and I could have sworn that the flames had now climbed even higher. The rotten odour had only gotten worse, invading my nostrils to the point where I nearly gagged. Look, I started with a far more sheepish tone than before, shining my torch at them. You kids need to put that out and find someplace else. This isn't my land, but the fellow who... The kid on the far left, a girl, turned around all of a sudden, her hair whipping round violently. I gasped sharply as the beam of the torch fell upon her face, a horrified jolt shooting through my body. The girl's face was deathly pale, like the flesh of a maggot painted crudely with the sores and patches of deeply decayed skin. Unlike it had seemed when her back was turned, her hair was now dirty and unkempt, hanging down in grimy strands in front of her face. There was little to say about her eyes, other than that they were those of someone who was dead. Completely milky white, and devoid of any traces of emotion. With a seemingly excruciating stiffness, her mouth fell open, a festering darkened graveyard packed with filthy tombstones. Then, with the same ease of someone in the prime of their young life, she spoke. Not with the voice of some otherworldly horror or with the croak of an old hag, but instead with the smooth, pleasant tone of a young woman. Hello, Oscar. I felt like I'd been struck by lightning. Every hair on my body stood on end, with my heart beating furiously, as though it were trying to escape from my chest. My name. She said my fucking name. Slowly, the other two members of the party turned around. My measly hope that they would appear normal died as soon as I laid my eyes on them. Both their appearances, the same grim picture of death that the girl was. The boy in the middle, a skinny blonde kid, looked as though he had drowned. His skin was wrinkled, mottled grey, and his hair was thoroughly soaked, some of it sticking to his face in a messy clump. The flames grew higher still. I began to walk backward, bile rising in my throat and the knot tightening so tautly that I found myself unable to speak. I... I... Don't tell me you don't remember us, Oscar. The blonde boy said in a nasty tone, a small torrent of dirty water spilling from his mouth as he spoke. The laughter started back up again as the three corpses sat there and stared blankly at me, the same joyous cackling as before. It didn't sound cruel or malicious. But that only made it worse, because of how chilling the distinction between the drunken laughter and the hollow expressions of these decaying youngsters was. The fire was a gargantuan funeral pyre now, 
reaching up past the trees and licking the onyx sky with its many forked tongues. I ran faster than I had ever run before, back across the field, their laughter still as loud as it had been when I was no more than five feet from them, only stopping when I vaulted over the gate and fell with a painful thud onto the gravel driveway. Until the door was shut and locked behind me, I could still feel the heat from the fire and the grim scent of acrid smoke and death still clung to the inside of my nose. The sheer terror that coursed through my veins made a mockery of the panic I had felt the night before. The adrenaline not even close to wearing off. I bolted up the stairs and into the study, knocking a stack of paper to the floor as I rushed to the window. It was now pitch black, the clouds having obscured the few stars that had shone dimly in the sky. The fire, like it had done so before, had disappeared. It had been so tall, higher than the biggest tree in those woods. Yet now it was gone. Hey guys, The Archivist here. If you'd like to hear part two of this story, make sure that you are following the channel as I will be releasing it pretty soon. Or if you're listening to this after I've already released it, well, just click on, click on the next one. That's pretty simple. Thanks for all your support. And if you're not already, do follow the channel and check out my Twitter, archivist underscore the, if you'd like to send me any ideas for stories you'd like to hear me read. Sleep well.